我十岁的时候，呃，我和我的同伴。When I was ten, my friends and I used to drink wonderful spring water. We used to play in the locust tree groves, and we could swim in the reservoir. From ninety four and ninety five, more seriously in ninety seven, ninety eight, and ninety nine. And especially in the spring sandstorm this year, 2000, it was fierce. The sand started covering everything. In the past, there wasn't any sand here. This was all grass. China's Lus Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across north central China. Unspoilt valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy, as well as our lives, could improve. Hills and gullies were designated as ecological zones to be protected. Farmers were given financial compensation for not farming on them and keeping their livestock pinned up. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Ethiopia, perhaps more than any other country, has come to symbolize the vulnerability of humankind to environmental catastrophe. This is a country whose problems have been increased by war and civil conflict. And now, human-induced climate change is predicted to make matters worse. As on the Lus Plateau, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. Yeah, that route could survive? No? no. no in just six survive. years, Professor Legessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged, 
where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Water is life. Without water, nobody can do anything. I'm amazed, as short as five years, six years, you get clean water like this, provided you work hard for restoring this degraded landscape. This is the largest uh, mountainous forest remaining in this region, the urban rift. And having different species, biological species, which are endemic, which can only be found in this area. And for instance, looking up about primates, it's in this area where you can have these uh, uh, chimpanzees in huge number of around 800 chimpanzees in the last census we did. Kambogo is one of the wardens who run this forest sanctuary. He knows its value isn't just as a haven for primates. Now, it is said that 70% of the waters in Rwanda come from Nyungwe. The rivers flowing in the east feed the river Nile. Then the rivers flowing in the west feed the river Congo. There are many springs in the park, and we are still even discovering more because of the impenetrable parts of the forest. The biodiversity, the water, and the soil fertility, which come from the Rwandan forest, don't just nourish the wildlife. All around the park, the people benefit as well. The thriving tea plantations depend on the water that flows from the forests as do all the farmers. The Rwandan hills and mountains are what is known in Africa as highland water towers. Traditionally, when the heavy rains come every year, the vast forest filters the water and regulates its flow. The water here is not only used by, by, by Rwandese. It goes throughout the Africa, it goes up to Egypt. This is going in Congo River. And in the east, it goes to the, the Nile River. And that, no one understands that if what is going there, it, come, it is coming from somewhere. It's coming from a functional system. But if instead of conserving the forest, humans denude the vegetation and degrade the lands, the water often floods, causing havoc across the region. In the turmoil that followed the genocide, Millions of displaced people physically destroyed vast swathes of Rwanda's unprotected forests. Dr. Rose Mukan Komeji remembers what the Gishwati forest was like when she was a girl. That was before the genocide, much of the overfarming and population growth, which some say underlies Rwanda's troubles. My goodness, it was green, it was a forest. I used to come from the south here to go to the just to Nyundo place. We used to pass one hour and a half traveling this Gishwati. But now it is not even 10 minutes. Everything has gone, specifically because of this pressure of population on natural resources. Yes. The Poverty Environment Initiative, as it's called, is a step towards linking ecological function and human well-being. But will it work? To try and find out, Alex travelled to neighbouring Kenya to meet Dr René Haller, a pioneer in restoring damaged ecosystems. Dr Haller's own experiment began in a cement factory quarry. Hard to find the landscape more ravaged, not even any soil. His challenge, 
to restore the ecosystem, to bring the quarry back to the garden. What is shown? It's possible to create a fertile soil even in the worst possible conditions. The basic thing was I saw that I have a, a jigsaw puzzle, but most of the pieces were missing. And so I was setting out for my vision, which I had, and a, a total ecosystem to, to be built. So I need all these bits and pieces, which I learned slowly, slowly. I, what I did was actually just giving it nature a helping hand. Dr. Haller's work was inspired by an unlikely creature, the red-legged millipede, which eats the fallen needles of the Causarina pine, creating humus and fertile soil in the once barren rock quarry. So then we introduced them into the quarry, but after a very short time, we had actually had them, uh, they established themselves very well. And now in the best parts, uh, where the soil is not washed off, we had up to 10 centimeters of, of humus on top. Dr. Haller's work has shown that by restoring vegetation cover and biodiversity, it's possible to retain the vital water needed in the ground. That helps overcoming drought and the arid conditions that have become so common in Africa where vegetation cover has been lost. Uh, what happened now, there's hardly a place in these quarries down there which has no vegetation. There's grass, there's trees, everything. Before, you know, it was uh, two and a half square kilometers of, of, of desert. 1,000 hectares being rehabilitated from a bare uh, non soil areas um, is to us brings some hope that uh, there, is, there is something that can be done for Rwandan soils. A measure of what restoring nature can do has been shown here on China's Lus Plateau, where farmers have continued to prosper despite the worst drought in decades. Since the beginning of the project, the soil that nurtures their crops has been accumulating organic material from plants and animals. This holds the moisture and contains carbon. What's interesting about this is all these root materials, all this other stuff, this is organic material. And this organic material is mixing together with the loose, the geologic soils here, and it's making a living soil. This is where the moisture resides. Yesterday it rained and there's still moisture in the soil. This is where the nutrients are recycled so that each generation of life emerges here. And this is where the carbon is. What's interesting about this, they made this field. This is new. So they're helping to sequester carbon. Living soils like this retain on average three times more carbon than the foliage above the ground. It is actually by investing in our ecological infrastructure and ecosystems in expanding the ability of nature to sequester and store carbon that we have the greatest opportunity to do something. And the wonderful thing is it's not only carbon sequestration, we're also faced with loss of ecosystems that will affect our food security, our water security. We're losing species on an unprecedented rate. So maintaining, restoring, protecting, expanding natural ecosystems has multiple benefits, immediate in terms of climate change, but also fundamental to the future of many of the services that we simply take for granted from nature. What we've seen in China, in Africa, and around the world is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. If we can transfer the capital, the technology, and empower the local people to restore their own environment, it'll have enormous benefits. Restoration can sequester carbon, reduce biodiversity loss, mitigate against flooding, drought, and famine. It can ensure food security for people who are now chronically hungry. Why don't we do this on a global scale?